I knew that it was going to be this way, and that's okay. I think okay, great. They're, uh, that's it's fascinating to hear that because um, I I don't know I don't remember even who this was. I want to say um, I want to say it was it was one of the one of the ladies that that works on our team here. I showed her. Um, I showed her that video that of of Herlin Kroberts at Marking Bars. I said, "Man, you gotta watch this. This is really good." And her first response was, "It was. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I knew it was important." And then she listened again. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, "Man, there's something about how that was brought to me that I knew I needed to listen." And so I go listen again and again and again. And I think that that's, you know, I'm no I'm no writer, but that has to be. That's got to be the some in some way the goal is that if you understand or at least that's what I'm hearing if you can understand everything that was put into this the first time it's presented to you it can't be that well crafted or am I missing the point well I I'm not sure I want to see mission accomplished regarding the woman watching the piece and I, I can I can see her I can see her watching it and having the reaction that you just said. And it feels like mission accomplished to me because it's just exciting that she knew something important was happening and she's figuring out a new way to to hear um, on a metaphysical level that gets me excited. And so I think I lost you after that <laughs> because I was excited about that. I, I guess that what I'm what what I was saying is that that see, that seems like that's it's interesting to hear you say that that's an intentional outcome that you want to have happen, you yeah. know? Oh, okay, that part. <clears throat> so that would that would be claiming a little too much brilliance. There's there's a channel that happens. I'm sitting down and I know it, it's starting to take shape. And so I make more sense of what's taking shape. But sometimes gosh, I've just never broken it down from this direction. There is an intentionality about everything, except that sometimes when I start writing, I don't know what it's going to be about. In fact, in Hurling Crow Words at Mocking Bars, there's a line that says, I cut trombones from the moment you walk that is, away. That is one of the best parts. I love that part so much. Thank you. It was the first line to Horsehead years earlier. Yeah. I ne it never even made it into Horsehead because of the editing process. All I knew was that I needed a poem that's, that, that had that line in it. I don't even remember where the line came from. I just knew I was walking around one day in Venice Beach and I cut trombones from the moment you walked away. And and then I spent three months on Horsehead and it never ended up in the poem. And then somehow out of nowhere when I was writing Hurling Crovers at Mocking Bars, there it was. Um, so the intentionality is not there in the sense that when I start writing sometimes, all I know is I'm living to my highest excitement. I know that this line has me excited. I know that I'm ready to write. I know that I'm. Um, this is what I do. This is what excites me. I know it's gonna be good because I've got that good feeling inside yeah. me and I know I'm about to deliver something powerful. And that's when, I, that's when I refuse to leave until I do. So in terms of intentionality, <clears throat> I can't claim that it's always there in the beginning. Sometimes it is. But generally, it's it's uh, it's coming from that energy engine, that passion, where I just know I have to. I you know what? It's I. There was a time. It's not as much anymore, but there was a time when I had to, and I can best explain it. Uh, I was in Alaska on tour with uh, Derek Brown and Anise Mojgani, and we had one of the best days of our lives. And, and one of the things we did that day was go mushing the the dog sleds, and and when we walked out back I was uh well first I, I was so worried about these dogs like god it's it's freezing I don't want to make these dogs pull me around <laughs> you were worried about the Why dogs we... and not yeah it's like the it's like the rodeo like those bulls do not want to be spurred man <laughs> you can I know it's tradition <laughs> yeah but they don't want to be spurred that's they're they're trying to get you off of their back yes. for a reason because they don't want you to be yes. there and so I was worried about the dogs and we got out there and man, Sanger, these things go 
crazy. They have to mush. They have to pull that sled. It's all they want to do. By the way, they can shit while they're doing that. While they're running. <laughs> yeah, because I was in the sled at one point. <laughs> <laughs> And I was dodging bullets. <laughs> yeah, that seems like that should have been in the uh, in the uh, in the waiver form you signed. Yeah. You it might really get should've. shit on, by the way. <laughs> you might take a pellet. Um, but I just remember they had to do that, and I was like, "Oh, we're going mushing!" Like there was once I knew that they were in it, I was in it completely, and that's how I felt for so long about writing. I just had to. I knew something was happening. I knew spiritually something was happening because I've been clawing into the spirit world for so long. I mean, I was, I was, I was driven to it. I, I hated the fact that I was gay. I hated it so much. I was really trying to. I was. I mean, I was diligently praying and switching religion. I was doing. I was seeking my whole life just to, you know, like when God hates you. You're screwed. <laughs> and from every angle, I just knew that God hated me because of what I was. And here's the thing. I really wanted to be down with God, the creator of everything, right? So I'm trying to find my way to this guy. And it's not possible when you're gay. I mean, it's it, it's and from every angle. People I love, the, the heroes I depended on for information. You know, I'm pretty... I, I'm, Still pretty sure if I hadn't been born gay, I'd be a douche. So I'm glad I was. <laughs> so I'm glad I was. I'm glad I was driven away from the bad information that I was getting. Um, but it was painful. It was dark. It was suicidal for not just like a moment, but for decades. You know, until meta. Until I. Well, until I discovered the moment. Until I discovered the moment, Hugh Prather, Benjamin Hoff, all of a sudden in college, marijuana, <laughs> all of a sudden these things were these things were showing me right now, and not some hell I was going to be in, or some hell from which I came, but right now where the judgment stopped and kindness was allowed in for myself. And a certain surrender began to happen. And when the judgments weren't there, there was a relief that was immeasurable. And I had not known these things. So that's what got introduced into the writing pretty early on is that despite my, you know, I took a lot longer to mature than my peers. And I think that's still the situation, but I, I, I did know my ideal self. I have always known my ideal self just haven't always been able to execute it anywhere other than writing. And so I think that's why the writing became so much, so successful at a younger age, despite wherever I was actually at in my life. The ideal self, I think that concept is really important to achieve significance in, in any field, in any way. Um, I'll work with my clients on that as well. I'll say, okay, close your eyes. Think of, think of that ideal buddy. And you know everything about that ideal self. You know what they, you know how he dresses, how he talks, what he's eating for dinner tonight, whether he worked out this morning, what time he woke up. You know everything about him. And the problem is for most of us, we're nowhere near that person. We're not that person at all 99% of the time. But the only chance that we have to reach that ideal self is to, to have that picture. And, and I think so many people exist through life with a foggy, you know, crayon drawn chicken scratch image of their ideal self. And it just looms over them. And, and that's what, that's where they feel that judgment is they feel judgment from, from something that they can't even articulate. They, all they know is that they're not living up to their ideal self, but they couldn't even really speak that self into existence. So they just anxiety, just oh, attention, just everything is bad. And there are a lot of things that cause those feelings, but I think that's such a big one is, you know, I used to, I used to have, before I kind of really understood my own ideal self, I would feel worthless no matter what I was doing. It, it didn't matter if I was, I could receive a lot of praise from my peers. I could be, you know, really, really like accepted into a group and I would still feel like everyone hated me or I could be professionally successful um, you know, achieve my business goals. And yet I would still feel like I'm a loser. 
like I'm worthless in this career. I'm not even good at being at, at this job. And it, and it followed me everywhere until I painted it and said, okay, well, that's what it is. That's really what it is. And it's not necessarily motivated by the things that he, you know, and her and well, all insane. these people want. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what you just said. It followed me everywhere I went, so I painted it down. And it's uh, it's looking directly at something. In fact, it's uh, it's something the first time I noticed how effective it is to just look directly at something is with shame. Shame yeah. has such this massive this massive reputation. I mean, there's there's this huge bully named Shame. And he's just that, an ineffectual childhood bully. When one looks at shame, literally looks at shame, whatever it is you're feeling shame about, it dissolves so quickly. It wants nothing to do with being seen. It just wants to loom. And I think it's brilliant for you to say that. It was following me everywhere, so I painted Yeah, I like that. I like the idea that, and you know, characterizing it as a bully. Yeah, you know, bullies don't even. Yeah, and they don't want to be called out, and they don't want you to face them or stand up, and that's what shame. That's what shame is. And they condense, and and I'm speaking in a scientific yeah. matter manner. They condense, like f for example, um, anger is just millions and billions of little sadnesses condensed. Hate is just the same thing of anger, and you know I've been meditating since 2005. Um, at, at least once a year, I'll, except until COVID, I would go to um, a Vipassana center and get reestablished in the mm -hmm. technique every year. For And there's no idol worship or guru or rites or rituals. It's just this, you know, scientific observation of breath and sensations without reacting to come out of habit patterns and blind reactions. And, and that's when I was able to start seeing all of these things scientifically that, it, that it's one thing the one thing leading to another like earlier i said witnessing is fundamental to to healing and similarly um serendipity is actually in, is fundamental to the infrastructure of consciousness it's it's literally the, the logical next thing that happens after presence when one becomes present the higher power actually starts to do its work you know and that higher power for people who roll their eyes like i would it's it's certain point have to be comfortable with realizing that their higher power might actually be their ideal self. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be this, you know, separate God way off in the sky sitting in a, you know, sending and receiving prayer requests, you know, like Santa. Up. It's, but it's, it's, it's actually a higher power. If you don't have one and you're listening to this, just consider your higher power, your ideal self that where you're actually happy and not in constant state of suffering, misery, or, criticizing or being skeptical or rolling your eyes, but just your higher power. Yeah. The, the, the danger in rejecting all ideas of faith or, or any religion or any spirituality is that the, you're left with no, I, no higher power at all. And, and the, I think that, that we can't exist that way. We can't exist with nothing above ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but so many people do, and that must've been really tempting for you as you went through life in your younger years and said, Oh my gosh, I feel unwelcome, you know, in the community and in, in, that I'm born in or wherever it was. I dodged that. I did. Uh, I knew, I always knew something. I always knew there was an emanating energy that I was connected to. And I don't think I ever had to, I don't think I ever, I, mean, I definitely was bummed about the, like the, this, the general white guy in the sky who was not answering my prayers. But I did know that there was an energy and that was my escape route when I started, if that makes sense. When I just started realizing it's all, there's a point of connection in everything, no matter how, no matter how far apart the things seem. And that ultimately we are all one and it's not just a Bob Marley song and you're me and I'm you and now is all that ever was or will be and we're on a continuum and there is no past or future. And when all that stuff starts to come into play, in fact, do you know what the most, I might be sidetracking, but Arrival, have you seen the movie Arrival? I can't get enough of what, it. What is that it's about? Amy oh Adams yeah, with the alien and, movie. Uh, Jeremy Renner. This movie does the most incredible things around how the continuum is actually playing out and the and communication 
neurologically and otherwise. 